over the last four weeks and five services, if you count last night's virtual message. We've been looking at and studying the significance of Jesus' birth and what Jesus brings us. We've looked at how Jesus brings hope in a dark time, how Jesus is himself the very hope that he brings. We've looked at how Jesus brings us his love as God lovingly, God the Father lovingly sends his Son, and God the, God the Son, Jesus lovingly comes down to lay down his life in our place to rescue and redeem us. And that Jesus brings us his joy. And we looked at from the perspective of Mary and Elizabeth and Zechariah and the joy that they couldn't contain as they're filled with the Holy Spirit and, and burst out in song because of the joy that they are so filled with because of who Jesus is and what he will accomplish. We've also looked at the peace that Jesus brings, that we've looked at, at Jesus' birth through the lens from the perspective of human history and seeing how our relationship with our Creator was broken due to sin and that it is only in Jesus coming down and taking on flesh and blood in order to lay down his life for us, to restore that broken relationship with us and God, so that he offers us peace, hope, love, and joy in his birth, in his coming down into his own creation. Well, there's something else that he also brings, something that may not be as welcome, and that is, he also brings division and that he brings us to a point of decision. He brings us to a point of the decision. Of We've looked at all of these other perspectives. But the question today is, what is your perspective? Who do you say that Jesus is? How do you view and see and respond to the advent of King Jesus? And in thinking of this question and concluding this series, as we've been, again, looking at and celebrating the birth, the advent, the coming of King Jesus, I want for us to look at two contrasting responses to Jesus as we're thinking about our own response. And that is going to be the response of the Magi, of the wise men, and of King Herod. So we're going to begin in Matthew's Gospel, turning to chapter 2, starting in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw the star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Israel with him. And so what we see here is the, the Magi, or the, the wise men, they are a, a cast of, of astronomers, of astrologers. They are uh, they, they are interested in natural science. By implication, they're magicians. In fact, the Greek word magios, or magioi the plural, is related to the English word magic, or shall I say the reverse, the English word magic stems from magios. And so by implication, uh, they, they were magicians, they were scientists, they were very interested in astronomy and astrology, and they are not Israelites. They are not followers of Yahweh. They are not Jews. And so one of the intriguing things about the story of the Magi, 
We don't know exactly where they come from. They come from the East, but we don't know exactly where they come from or how they come to this knowledge or why exactly they're so interested in this baby. It's not just that they're interested enough to ask questions or to read a book or a biography about this baby. They are so intrigued that they actually go to great lengths to find this baby, putting their own lives at risk, asking King Herod about this other new king being born in his jurisdiction. And they, so they put themselves at risk. They go at this at great lengths to travel, great expense to travel, to try to find this baby in order to worship him. And so they relentlessly pursue Jesus at great cost to themselves. And it's intriguing that they're so, that they're actually interested and intrigued and so committed to find him that they go embark on this journey and that they come not just to ask questions or to see what he looks like or meet the family, but they come to worship him. They travel all this way to fall before the feet of this little baby to worship him. And what, what intrigues me is that God speaks to them in a language that they will respond to. They are interested in the stars. They may not know the Hebrew scriptures or the prophecies, but they're interested in the stars. And God speaks to them in a way that is specific to them, that they are concerned about, that they will respond to in obedience. And so the story of the Magi is a story from the far off, the unlikely being called and brought before King Jesus. And that is the story that we see unfold in the Magi. King Herod, by contrast, responds being deeply troubled, deeply troubled by this infant. And that he, it it may seem weird. Why would he be so disturbed and so troubled by this baby being born? Well, just because a couple of of, of far-off people come and ask for him. Okay, these people are a little crazy. Who cares? But no, he is deeply troubled because these educated men of influence from far off are not just interested and intrigued, but are going to such great lengths to find him in order to worship him. If these distant, unlikely pagans are so interested and committed to this baby, they call a king of the Jews, how much more does King Herod have to worry about the Jews who are under his rule? So he is deeply troubled by baby Jesus, not because the theology, oh, my my theology was wrong. I didn't know this was coming or I didn't. His, His concern is about his own reign, his own rule, his own authority being challenged and threatened. He's threatened by baby Jesus. And when you recognize that King Herod is a jealous ruler who killed his wife and two of his sons out of his jealousy and over his concern to protect his throne and his reign and rule, this is the same King Herod who passionately also pursues Jesus, but for very different reasons than the Magi. The Magi come to lay down at his feet and worship the king, whereas King Herod comes and seeks him in order to kill the rival king. So Herod calls in the Jewish leaders to ask, well, where is this? Where the, the, does the prophecy say that he's going to be born? The Messiah is going to be born. And they all tell him it's going to be in Bethlehem. And so then he calls the, the Magi back into a room and says, okay, go and find, carefully search for baby Jesus, but report back to me as soon as possible so that I can also go and worship this king. And so the Magi go, 
And continuing on in verse 9, after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And one of the things that's so interesting here is Matthew makes it sound like it's so easy. They just follow this little star, and there he is. It's so simple. Well, why can't King Herod, in all of his wealth and his, his, all that he has at his disposal, all of his resources, the shepherds so easily find baby Jesus while he's still there in the stable? And the, the, the Magi, likewise, seem to so easily find Jesus. Why is it that King Herod is not able to do so? It seems to be so simple. And the answer is that God leads the shepherds to find Jesus. God leads the Magi to find Jesus. He does not lead Herod. In fact, Jesus is protected when Herod seeks to kill him. Jesus cannot be found and is protected. And so God calls these unlikely men to come and find him, and he directs them and guides them to find Jesus in order that they can worship him. And we see the Magi responding in humble obedience and in worship while King Herod responds to baby Jesus in defiant opposition, refusing to bend the knee. As baby Jesus, even as an infant, is bringing people to a decision where you can't remain indifferent. You can't remain apathetic. You can't remain disinterested in the question of who is this baby? The hope, the joy, the love, the light of the world brings us to this point of decision, a life-changing decision that will govern our lives. Continuing on, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened up their treasures and presenting him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to King Herod, they returned back to their country by another route. And so by this point, Jesus is a toddler. This is, you know, in the nativity scenes, we often see the, the magi and the shepherds and the family and the angels all there. But they don't all arrive at the same time. The shepherds were nearby and came and saw Jesus while he was still in the stable. Here the magi come when Jesus is older and is no longer in the stable. But God leads them both, and both of these are unlikely groups of people, to come and find Jesus and to worship him. And they give him the gifts, they give him these kingly gifts. And it's, it's interesting from an Old Testament perspective, you read this, and in, in, in knowing the stories of the Old Testament, you quickly realize that this, this is very similar to another Old Testament story. Where the queen of Sheba, if you remember, hears of King Solomon's great wisdom. And she's intrigued, and so she travels this far distance to come and meet the king of Israel. And she is astounded by his wisdom and by his great success that God has blessed him with. And she also gives the king of Israel gold and precious stones and incense. And, and she leaves with this astonishment. And here now, the one greater than Solomon, the king greater 
than Solomon's father David. The promised Davidic king is born, and yet again, men from a distance have heard of this great king and have come to worship him and to bring him kingly gifts. And they fall down before this baby and worship him. And it's even further than that, that God speaks to them in this dream and that he warns them to go back a different way and to not trust King Herod. And so they respond in obedience to God in, in not reporting back to Herod and also in going back a different way. This story also reminds me of, as we're thinking about the two very different responses to Jesus and being brought to this point of decision, reminds me of the scenario when Jesus, as an adult, asks his disciples, his followers, to come to this point of decision. In Matthew chapter 16, in verse 13, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But Jesus looks at them and says, But what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter responds, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replies, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And so Jesus brings people to this point of decision of who do you say that I am? It can't stop at who my parents say that Jesus is. Who the pastor up on the stage Sunday mornings, what, who he says that Jesus is. Each one of us will stand before God and, and it, we are all responsible for who we say that he is. Will, do we respond? as the wise men who may be so unlikely characters to find themselves before the King Jesus' feet, but those are the people that Jesus pursues. Will you respond in humility and obedience and worship as the wise men did? Or will you respond like King Herod, who, is, who sees King Jesus as a rival, to his throne and refuses to bow the knee. But you see, we all are kings of our own lives being called to submit to a greater king. And that takes a deep level of humility for any of us to say, I relinquish my throne you can rule and reign in my life, and I will bow before King Jesus. Not just add this to my set of beliefs, to my worldview, but you can rule and reign on the throne of my heart. Change me. Change my heart, my thoughts, my actions, my desires to actually submit to his rule and reign. So the, the fundamental question I want to leave us with as we go forward and, and continue to celebrate the birth of King Jesus is I want for us to stop and recognize and, and stop. And if you haven't made the decision of who you believe Jesus is and what your response is, you make a decision whether you realize it or not or you try to postpone it or put it off. There is no way out of responding to who Jesus is. And no matter how far off you may be, he is calling you to come and worship the king. Would you pray with me? Lord, 
We come before you and thank you for all that you are and all that you fulfill and accomplish in coming into your own creation as a humble baby. We're so thankful, Lord, that you loved us first, that you offer us your hope and your love and your joy and your peace that is only found in you. And Lord, I ask that anyone who doesn't know you, either here in this sanctuary this morning or watching the live stream or the recording after, I ask that you would, that you would guide and direct them to you, that you would move the star in their life to come and find and respond to the King of Kings. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. As part of that response, I want to offer the, I want us to take communion together. And if you have accepted Jesus, this is an opportunity for us to celebrate that together in remembering and celebrating Christ's sacrifice for us. I'm going to ask for the ushers to grab the communion elements at the back of the sanctuary. And as you receive those, don't take them just yet. We will take them together here in just a moment. And if you haven't accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I ask that you just allow it to pass by you, and that's okay. No, there's no, no judgment, no, oh, who's taken, who's not. But if you have, we will celebrate together who Jesus is, what he's accomplished, and what he's done for us. I'm going to go ahead and pray as these continue to go around. Lord, we thank you for laying down your life in our place, for your love, for your peace, and your, your joy. And Lord, as we, just rem as we remember and celebrate your birth, we do so recognizing that you came not in order to be lifted up and to, to be just given great things. You came in order to die for us. And we're so thankful, Lord. We praise you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So would you, with me, go ahead and break the bread remembering Christ's body broken for you. And take it. Thank you, Lord. And likewise, that you take the juice and remembering Jesus' blood shed for us, would you take it? Thank you. 